Well, I have really been looking forward to this Sunday. Uh, Brian and Sarah had the opportunity to, to have some vacation time this past week. And he said, hey, why don't I not prepare a sermon and you preach? I was like, great, that's, co- that's cool. So I've been looking forward to this week. But, you know, Gabe said we started out the service with Father Abraham. He's like, well, the, the, the children's guys is preaching this week, so we have to do something, you know, kid-friendly. And that's, you know, once the, the, the youth and student guys on stage are a kid's guy, like, you never know what you're going to get. And so I want to start kind of the way that I would typically start one of my lessons with student ministry with some little, you know, like, interaction, some, some involvement. I like to start with a game. And so uh, what I'll do, we'll, we'll do some, like, famous pairs, like, I have Cheryl up here, so I know that there's going to be some, some feedback. I know that somebody's <laughs> going to talk to me, so I'm good. But um, I'll throw out a word, and you, th- you give me the word that goes with it. You got it? So, kind of opposites. Like, first example that comes to mind, peanut butter and... Jelly. Correct, jelly. Now, I would also accept banana, the fully acceptable answer right there. Um, this and that, very good. Uh, black and okay. Uh, one of my favorites, Batman and okay, good. Uh, we, we live in Cleveland area, so rock and okay. Make sure y'all got that right. For for my '80s and '90s folks, guns and kind of related. Y'all some heathens. Y'all going to hell? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Kidding. I'm gonna get fired already. There's a ton of them in the food area, right? Like lots of pears. Spaghetti and meatballs. Very good. Uh, salt and salt. Oh, sorry. <laughs> salt and vinegar. Oh well, yeah. Chips especially. That's good. Uh, green eggs and see that's the kids area and the food area, right? Toast and eggs. I love them. It's what I had for breakfast. Um, biscuit. Oh, southern southern guy. Biscuits and hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> Macaroni and all right. Here's the one, something bad happens, you, you log into Facebook, you watch the news, we're sending our thoughts in. Yes. Am I the only one that that just bothers? Like, I understand the intent, the meaning, like, we're sending our thoughts and prayers, but I just feel like it's a lie, <laughs> you know? We're sending our thoughts and prayers, like, no, you're not. Um, because your thought is, I'm thinking about it right now, I'm not going to think about it again later. Or if you do, it's only because you're gossiping to somebody else. I'm, I'm telling on myself. I'm, I'm being honest. And prayers, are you, are you really going to pray? Some people will. But in all likelihood, yeah. We're just, it's, it's, it's a sentiment. It makes me look good saying I'm setting my thoughts and prayers. I'm not like being mean, stepping on your toes. I'm just being honest. And it bugs me because it's become so commonplace, right? And, and, and I, I feel like we do that with prayer a lot of times. I love that we've been talking about the armor of God and, and the past last week and this week, we move into talking about prayer. And I love how they're so closely linked. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But as I think about prayer, I don't want prayer to be kind of one of those, you know, it's, it's something that Christians do. Let's say you're supposed to pray. I don't really do it a lot. But we, we, we tend to, to, to treat prayer like that sometimes. If we're honest, it, it, you know, well-meaning people, you know, we've done all we can do. All we can do is pray. That bugs me too. <laughs> because prayers, it bugs me because of, it's well-meaning, but it, it kind of relegates prayer as like a last-ditch effort type thing. I think there's a lot of truth in that statement. All we can do is pray. Exactly. That is all we can do is pray. On our own strength and our own power, we can try and try, but we are worthless without the empowerment of God, of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. All we can do is pray. Yes, that's where we need to start. I saw a quote, uh, if y'all are familiar with the book, The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. The quote says, you can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you've prayed. All we can do is pray. Exactly right. Prayer is important. And we'll see why it's important this morning. It's crucial. I love that that Pastor Jim started off 
last week and, and in our time of prayer. And so as we get ready to look at his word, we're in Ephesians 6. I want to go ahead and look at the verse he taught on last week as we look into this week and kind of, kind of touch on that for a minute. So if you've turned to Ephesians 6, if not, I'll, I'll have it up here. If you would, go ahead and stand as we honor God's word as we read it together. Ephesians 6, chapter, 18, uh, chapter 6, verse 18, excuse me, says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Let's pray. God, as we talk about prayer, I just want to start by coming to you. And God, um, I just pray that you'll talk to us, that you'll teach us, that you'll melt down any barriers in our heart that might keep us from hearing the message that you have for us today. Um, God, inhabit this time, and uh, I just pray that you be glorified as we learn about you. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. So last week, uh, Pastor Jim gave us some, some really good uh, foundations to, to start on. First, that he's, he says, you know, Paul says, praying in the Spirit. We'll talk more about that in a second. But, but as we follow and submit ourselves to the Spirit, as we follow his leadership, how do we pray? Pastor Jim talked about praying on all occasions, not like... Um, there was a song I heard one time, and it said, like, if I was as smart as Christopher, I'd find a closet. And I was like, what does that mean? And I actually had an opportunity to meet the band, and I'm like, what does this mean? It's a, it's a crazy lyric. And apparently there was this, some guy named Christopher Smart who, like, took every word of the Bible completely literal. And so he walked around all the time praying. And, like, I, I don't, as Pastor Jim pointed out last week, that's not what he's saying. It's not all the time but a spirit of prayer, a connectedness to God on all occasions. He said sometimes that means structured times. Pastor Jim talked about that morning and evening, that waking up. I'm not talking about Monday morning when you wake up and you're like, oh God. <laughs> I mean, I've been there. <laughs> but those times when you wake up in the morning and you stop and you're like, wait a minute, I need to get my focus right. God, thank you for another day that I get to serve you. Thank you for another day of life here on earth. Thank you for time. God, I just give you today. I want to serve you well today. Short morning prayer. In the evening, God, I, I pray that I've served you well today. God, forgive me for where I've messed up today. God, prepare my mind. Give me rest for tomorrow. Those morning and evening prayers. Short, you know, just connecting to God morning and evening. Sometimes there's spontaneous times. Sometimes it, it amazes me how many times I see the Holy Spirit doing this in my life. I'll be just like doing my thing, watching TV or working, like whatever. And I'm like, I can't stop thinking of somebody. I'm like, this is weird. So I just stop and I'm like, all right, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to pray for my Aunt Jan right now. I don't know what's going on in her life, but I, I love her and I know you love her. And so I just pray that you be glorified in her life. And later I'll call her. I was like, man, I just prayed for you this morning. She's like, I, I could use it because I was struggling. It's amazing how many times God will, will give somebody to me to say, pray for this person. Sometimes you'll see somebody and you're like, man, I can just tell by their countenance that they are struggling. I need to go give them some love. God gives us those opportunities to be spontaneous, to love people that way, to pray with them. Pastor Jim also talked about all kinds of prayers that we pray. As Paul talks about this all times and in various kinds of ways, Public prayers, we, we talked about last week that it's okay to pray in public. Like if I'm good on stage and using those big, you know, giant words and like, look at me, I pray good. Well, it's all well and good. But I pray. And like that's not, that's not cool. But it's okay for us to gather together and to, to pray publicly, to pray together. Private prayers, those times when you find your private place to just connect and get intimate with God. Breath prayers, if you remember Pastor Jim talking about those, man, how many times have you found yourself in a situation that's like, God, give me patience right now as I deal with this person. <laughs> God, give me strength as I try to serve you well. 
God, give me wisdom as I have to make this. Those just short breathing out. God, help me right now. Those breath prayers. I find myself doing that a lot. Uh, persevering prayers, intercessory prayers, pray for other people. And as we, as we look at today's passage, as we get going, Paul says, you know, there's, there's lots of different types of prayers. And here's one, an intercessory prayer that I would like for you to pray. Paul begins this passage. He's like, like pray for everybody. Pray for each other. Pray all the time. But pray for me. Like, like I need prayer. So as you're praying, I'm asking you to pray for me. When, when I look at Paul, my first thought is, why is he even asking for prayer? Like, he's like, like spiritual ninja warrior type. Like, he's like a big dude in, in the realm of like spiritual leaders. And like, he's the guy. Like, he's smart. He's write, written all the Bible. And like, he's the go to. He knows stuff. And I'm like, why is Paul asking for prayer? And to me, it shows his vulnerability. Him saying, he said before, he's like, here's all my accomplishments. They're like a dung heap. And Paul, I think, again, is, is, is coming at it. It's like, I, I don't have all the answers. I don't have everything together. I need to be connected to God. And I think, I think this is showing Paul's vulnerability, saying, like, I don't have everything together. I need prayer. And so if Paul needs prayer... This guy who I think of as a spiritual powerhouse, clearly we need prayer. Would you agree with that? We, we need prayer? Okay. And so, especially if we think about the situation Paul's in here. Um, not an uncommon situation, but Paul's in prison. <laughs> he's found himself there before. Um, he, it's, it's, I think it's kind of funny. Like He's like this church leader, and he's always in prison, and like, Man, he couldn't pull that today. Like, if y'all always having to bail being Brian out of prison, <laughs> like this probably wouldn't be cool. But, but Paul is always finding himself in prison. The church was actually persecuted at, at times, and, and teaching about Jesus was, was not acceptable. And they, he found himself in these situations, and he's like, well, here I am, so maybe I'll just talk to the guy next to me and tell him about this guy, Jesus. Or, I've planted all these churches, let me write some letters and just encourage them. So here we are, he's in prison, he's writing this letter, encouraging the church. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, it's not uncommon for Paul to be in prison, but it's also not uncommon for him to ask for changes in his circumstances. Sometimes he says, hey, pray that things will be different. Um, in Romans, he says, pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea. He was wanting the circumstances to change. Second Thessalonians, pray that we may be del delivered from wicked and evil people for not everyone has faith. So there's times when Paul's like, man, it's kind of tough right now. Pray that the circumstances will change. As we'll see, that's not what Paul starts pray, asking for prayers for here. He's not asking for his circumstances to change. And I'm like, well, that's going to be the first thing that I pray for. I'm like, I'm in prison. Like, y'all pray that I get out of here, right? Yeah. <laughs> but Paul, on the other hand, sees that there's a reason for him being where he is. That's a tough thing for me to grasp sometimes because I find myself at times in a place where I'm like, yeah, I don't like this season. I don't like what I'm going through. I feel like things need to be different. I, I, God's told me something else. He's going to use me here. and He needs to put me there now. I don't like what I'm going through. And I think we need to follow Paul's lead and realize we need to bloom where we're planted, that God has us here for a reason. In Philippians, which I will quote numerous times, Paul, Paul kind of echoes that. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As results become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul knows that he was put in this place for a reason. He has an opportunity to share with those. Like he's talking to the palace guard. He's like, let me tell you about this dude, Jesus. Like y'all been looking for Messiah. We've been looking for Messiah. Like, like he is, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one that's been promised. He, he sees that the, the gospel is being spread. People are believing. And he's like, here's where I am. I'm going to be faithful to the calling that I have on my life right here and now. And so, as I look at today's passage, when Paul's asking for prayer, 
I, I look and he's, he's praying for me, but, but the thing that really jumps off the page at me, Paul's attitude is seen in this one word. He's like, I'm an ambassador. What in the world is an ambassador? <laughs> well, you know, if you Google it, because I believe in the Google machine, Google, I found it says a dip, uh, an ambassador is a diplomatic official of the highest rank, rank sent by one sovereign or state to another as its resident representative. It's basically someone who represents a state, a king, or whatever in a foreign land. A representative. Paul's like, I'm an ambassador, obviously, of, of Christ. I'm representing Christ in this land, in this area where, where it's not my home. So well, what does an ambassador do? Well, an ambassador will represent the one who sends him. So it's a representative. An ambassador will speak a message on behalf of the person he's representing. So sometimes he's sent with a message. Um, an ambassador speaks with authority on behalf of that person or entity he's representing. And finally, he must be in constant communication with who he is representing so that he represents them well, right? You see where I'm heading with this? Uh, read between the lines. You, you see it coming. So Paul says, I'm an ambassador. I'm representing God. Well, Paul also says, follow me as I follow Christ. Be like me, not because I've got it all together, because I'm doing everything I can to be an example for you. And so one thing that we see throughout Scripture, and we see Paul pushing this fact is that not only is he an ambassador, but we are also his ambassadors. If we are followers of Christ, if we are believers, the Bible says that we are his representatives. Representatives, I stumble all over that word every time. We are his representatives in a foreign land. 2 Corinthians, another letter by Paul, says he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I, I love this, this passage. Like, God has, has reconciled us to himself. Like, I don't know if y'all realize, but, like, our relationship with God was broken. <laughs> like, God created us with intimacy, and thanks to sin, there was a great, great divide. That relationship was completely broken. Nothing we could do about it. We were separated. But God had a plan. He sacrificed his son on the cross to pay the debt for our sin so that we can be reunited, so that we can be reconciled. And so God has given us reconcil reconciliation, being made right with him. But he's also said, now I want you to tell other people. I want you to help, to be my agents on earth, to help us reconcile other people, to care for them, to help them to realize that they're not on their own, that their God, their creator loves them passionately, that he wants to have a restored relationship with him. And so he's entrusted us as his ambassadors in this foreign land. We are his ambassadors. I love that this comes right on the end of where we're talking about the armor of God. We're still in the armor of God series and, and when I think about the armor, I like I'm teaching kids about the armor of God. You, like, you put on the little helmet and the, all this stuff, and you're like, woo. But the armor of God, it's like this cool image. But it's also uh, good to realize that it's not just me pu putting on armor and going into battle to win the fight. Like, I'm not on my own. I'm not, we're, we're not gladiators. Does that make sense? We're not here fighting for our life, just doing our own thing. We are representing the king that we're fighting for. We're, we're battling with an army. We're going as Christ's ambassadors, as his representatives. We're, we're not on our own. We're not um, just trying to, to, to make it by ourselves. We're representing him. We are his ambassadors. And prayer, it's, it's, not, it's not like, you know, you have the breastplate. And the helmet. Like, it's not another tool. It's not... Um, another weapon or a, a, a something for defense. Prayer is, is what connects us. Prayer is what holds it all together. Prayer is, is the, the connection to God. So we are his, ambassador, his ambassadors, and we are empowered by prayer. Like, we're not on our own. 
Prayer is what holds us, what keeps us connected to God. I, I think as, as Church of the Open Door, this, this, is, this is hopefully language you've heard, right? Because we talk about we're, we're leading people in the, in the adventure of becoming like Christ. And we're like, well, what does that look like? So we have this Christ acronym with these, these attributes of Christ. Well, here's what Christ looks like. Well, the very first one in the Christ acronym is we're connected to God through the word and prayer. The, the, the Bible, like God's word, that's, that's what we read, we learn about him. It's his revelation of himself to us. But we stay connected to God through prayer. Like as we put on this armor and go do battle, we're connected to our leader through prayer. As we struggle, as we seek direction, as we make choices, as we live life, we have to stay connected to God. And we do that through prayer. Uh, Pastor Jim has, has talked about it often, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, but John 15, you, you see this whole thing uh, in, in, in this passage. John says, Remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's that connectedness. Every time I read this passage, I think about when I was in, I guess, I guess it was when I was in college. It may have been high school. But my grandmother had this vine that I was like, oh, this is really, I'm like, I'm not a plant. Like, whatever, it's a plant. But it's never been a thing. But she had this vine that I just thought was so cool. It's full and it just lush. And I was so enamored with it. And when I was in college, she gave me my own. She's like, you love this so, so you need one. You have your own place now. Here you go. So I had this vine. And she, you know, she, she babied me. She, we were close in college, and she'd come over and uh, water my plants and do my laundry and cook me dinner and all that stuff. <laughs> but she loved me. Um, but she'd take care of this plant, and she would put this stuff called rapid grow. Man, that's like plant steroids. I, I've decided because, like, all of a sudden that vine, it's like, it's like, you know, it's all lush and it's hanging down all over the place and it's all in the floor and we started tacking it up and it started to keep growing. Eventually I had it in the corner of my room and we had it up the wall and all the way around the ceiling. Like, it just like, I had like a forest in my bedroom. It was amazing. But I always think about that um, because there's times when <laughs> I wasn't the best at watering it and like pieces would fall off. Or if I went and I'm like, it's too long, I need to trim it back, and I cut it off. Well, I can't take that piece that I cut off and I'm like, cool, you lay there and you're going to grow over here. Well, I mean, granted, you can splice it in, repot it, all that stuff. But for the point of my analogy, <laughs> for the point of, if you cut a piece off, like it's not getting water anymore, right? It's not getting nourishment. It's on its own. I think that's a great picture of us. Like if we're not remaining in the vine, we don't have what, what the soil offers. We don't have the water that's coming through, nourishing us, empowering us to live. Like, we have to stay connected to the power source. It's like the battery in your car. If it's unplugged, like, it's not going to crank. And so we need to stay connected to the power source, connected to the God through prayer. I, I feel like that's, to me, it's so encouraging because there's times when I feel like I'm trying to do this on my own. I'm trying to live life without, you know, I, I try to like, well, I've got to make decisions. and I've got to make this happen. I need to, and the reality is, I need to just trust God. Like if he says I'm going to do something, he's going to do it. If he says I want to use you to do something, great, he's going to use me. I don't have to make it happen. I, I, this past year, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you, one of the best books I read this past year it's called The Tale of Three Kings. It's about David and uh, Saul and Absalom. But I, I love the picture of David. Not like God said, David, I'm going to make you into a king. I'm going to make this happen. And David had so many opportunities to kind of step forward and make it happen. It's like, well, God said it's going to happen, so I'm going to make it happen now. David took a very hands-off approach and said, you know what? If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I don't need to do anything. I struggle in that area. I want to make things happen. 
God says, I, 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 want, I want to do this in your life. Good, I'm going to make it happen. No, that's, that's not what I said. He said, I'm going to do this. And so it, it's encouraging to me to realize that, that we are empowered by prayer, that we are connected to God, that he is our power source. He is using us. He's guiding us. And, and we need to stay connected. But, again, my tendency, often your tendency, is to get distracted and to focus on our own abilities and what can I do. That's just where I live. And you know what? The reality is that makes me insecure. That, that, that points out the, the, reali- the realization that I can't do it all on my own. I try to do things, and the reality is I can't. Um, God created us as dependent people. We need him. We need to trust him. We need to uh, rely on him. So the reality is we are insecure. And I don't necessarily think that's always a bad thing, to be honest. Uh, Maybe insecure isn't the best word. We have our shortcomings. We are weak. Compared to God, we are weak. But Paul says, in my weakness, God is made strong. And so embrace our weaknesses. What I want us to see today is that as we look at what Paul prayed, I don't know that Paul is actually admitting weaknesses or just admitting that he is human. But he's like, pray for me that all these things will happen. Uh, we need to go to him in prayer. Uh, several places throughout Scripture, you'll, you'll see that, that prayer is the answer to any shortcomings we have. Um, again, Philippians. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Don't be anxious. Don't be like all uptight. Don't, don't worry about stuff. Give it to God. Like maybe it's finances. Give it to God. Maybe it's health. Give it to God. Whatever it is, prayer is the answer. Go to him. It, he, he, he may not answer it the way you like. I've come to realize that as well. Sometimes he's like, I have you there for a reason. You want your circumstances changed. I want you to bloom where you're planted. So be prepared that, that he may leave us right where we are, but he's got a purpose for that as well. But we need to go to him. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Even in that stormy spot, even in the valley of the shadow of death, he's with us and he cares for us. And sometimes he'll allow us to go through some tough times, but he is with us. He's walking through that with us. So does Paul... Is Paul saying, he's praying, says, pray for me, but is, is it his, him saying that, that there's, oh, I got ahead of myself. Is, is he saying that it's insecurity, like, like I'm, I'm afraid or I don't know what I'm doing? I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> there's no really ev- evidence of that in the passage. I think maybe Paul realizes he's human and that, that he is insufficient on his own. And he's just claiming the fact that he's dependent on God, that he has to have the Holy Spirit working on him and through him and with him. But he is also an ambassador. So uh, as we look at our insecurities, I, I think that in, in, in the passage that we're looking at today, we'll see some of our own insecurities, but we'll also see how prayer answers each of our insecurities. Um, Paul starts out, you know, with, um, well, before, sorry, our, our first insecurity, I don't know where to start. Well, that's because Paul is, is saying uh, his main calling is to share the gospel. All over, you see that, the God, that Paul is saying, I'm going to, to share the good news with the Gentiles. And, and sometimes, as, as his ambassadors, we're his ambassadors too, our job is to share the good news with those around us. And so as we look at that, a lot of times our first insecurity is like, well, you want me to share with people, but like, where do I start? Do I like, like just gather people together and start talking to them or whatever? And so my insecurity is I don't know where to start. Well, the answer is to pray for opportunities. Um, Paul says, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given. Paul Paul knows that he's an ambassador. 
He, he wants to make known the mystery of the gospel. And so he realizes that I've got to have opportunities to, to make known the, 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 the mystery of the gospel. He has to have opportunities to share with those around him. Well, as, as God's ambassador, we also need to be looking for those opportunities to make known the mystery of the gospel. We, we, we need to look for opportunities to share. And, and when I talk about that, I immediately have this wall that starts coming up. And, and that's partly because of my background and the way that I was raised. I was raised in the evangelical church, more conservative, Southern Baptist, if you're curious. Um, but I, in a time when the focus was, let's go share the gospel. Let's make converts. Let's you know, go out. And so we had to meet, um, usually weekly, and we would like learn. Sometimes I have two different classes that I went through where you learn this gospel presentation outline, and we would have to go knock on doors and ask people, hey, if you die tonight, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? Like, I, like, my anxiety is rising just thinking about that. Like, I'm not even an introvert, and I'm like, that freaks me out, you know? Um, going door to door, talking to people, like, like I, I, that's, that's not me. In, in, our, in our society today, like, I, I, I would question whether or not that's the most effective strategy. Like, that's right for some people, I'm sure, not me. But whatever it looks like, I need to pray for those opportunities. Paul, I think Paul right here, he's like, whenever I speak, I think he's assuming the opportunity is going to be there. He's like, you know, th- there's going to be times when I'm stuck next to somebody in a prison cell. And so I, I, I'm looking for those opportunities. I, I think the big key there is that, that we will look for those opportunities, that we will... Uh, be aware of those around us to, to look for, you know, is there an opportunity for me to love someone? Is there an opportunity for me to encourage someone? Um, I don't know where to start. Well, Paul's saying, look, I, I'm an ambassador. I realize the calling of my life is to take the gospel to the Gentiles. I'm going to submit my will to God's will so that anytime those opportunities come, I'm going to take them. And I think that's, that's key for us is not to say I have to be like this guy standing on the street corner and, and before the Guardians game who's yelling into a megaphone. I can't understand half of what he's saying anyway, but he loves Jesus more than me, so I need to be like him. That's not at all what I'm saying. Maybe that is right for you. It's not right for me. But what are those opportunities that you're given? What are the opportunities that I'm given? Am I being willing when those opportunities are presented? Am I submitting my will? Hey, I don't want to look like one of those guys, you know? Or am I saying, God's leading me to love this person or to share with this person? And as we talk about sharing our faith with other people, as we talk about praying for opportunities, I I wanted to give us a couple of just a few little tips. Um, One of the things that I think about is several years ago, there's a guy named Bill Hybels wrote a book called Just Walk Across the Room. I think that's, for me, one of the big things. Sometimes I'm just too nervous to start conversation. Walk up to people and, hey, how's it going? (laughs) That's not earth-shattering. But it's, am I willing to engage with people? Am I willing to talk to people? Am I willing to love people where they're at? Um, So just walk across the room and have a conversation with people. That's really the place to start. You don't have to walk up, hey, do you know Jesus? Like, like... I'm like, I'm about to introduce you to him, <laughs> you know, if you don't get out of my face. But it doesn't have to be awkward. Have a conversation. I think it's important that we know our story and that we share our story. As we pray for those opportunities, I need to be, real, to, to be aware of what God has done in my life and be willing to share that with others. God has put me in some specific situations and used me in different ways and let me go through some struggles that not everybody's going to suffer. Like, I, my, I, many of you know that I went through a bout of cancer several years ago. It scared me to death, and I was there seeing so many people hurting. My, every time I hear someone now mention that someone in their family has cancer or struggling with cancer, like, my heart starts aching, 
and hurting and breaking. That's something that God has given me to reach out and to love people as, as family members are going through this or as someone is going through chemo and radiation. So like all those things, that's something in my story that God has used to love other people. Uh, what is your story? How has God used you? What has God done in your life? How have you seen him work? When are those times, I, I could think of a couple of times, I mentioned finances, where even after Jen and I were married, where we said, you know what? There's more bills than there is money. And I don't know how, I, I know this is where God wants us to be. This is what God wants us to do. I'm trying to be faithful, but I don't see how we're going to pay the bills. And God has come through in miraculous ways. Um, trusting him, trusting that I'm where I need to be. As a result, when I see people struggling, if I'm able to help, I want to help. If I see people uh, who, who need an extra hand, like if I can, I want to be the help that we were given in those situations. How has God used you in your story? As you pray for opportunities, you start looking for people. How can I love that person? God, show me someone who's hurting that I can comfort. God, who needs a friend? So many times in my life, I've, I've had people who are like, hey, I'm going to be your friend. And so now, I'm like, there's been several times I've just gone up like, what's up, dude? Let's go hang out. Because somebody's done that with me, and it's given me opportunity to love them. Pray for opportunities to build those relationships with others. So insecurity number one, I don't know where to start. Pray for opportunities. Insecurity number two, I don't know what to say. I think as we, as we look for opportunities to, to share with people and to talk about Jesus, I think if we're honest, a lot of times we're like, well, what if they ask that question that I just like, man, I don't even know. Or they give you this argument against God that you're like, well, that kind of makes sense. Maybe, maybe I need to question everything that I believe. Like, we're so afraid of questions. One thing, it's okay to say, man, I don't know. I, I'd be glad to, to dig in and, and, and look at that with you. But we, a lot of times, are afraid to share the, the hope that's within us, the good news of Jesus Christ, because we're just simply afraid of what to say. Pray for the words. Pray for clarity as you share, as you talk to people. Um, see this several times in Scripture. But, but Paul, he's, he's like, pray for me that whenever I speak, I, words may be given so that I'll make known the mystery. Like, give me the words to say. Pray that I don't mess it up. Pray that I say the right thing. Well, again, who is this talking? This is Paul. Paul, like, the, the name Gamaliel probably means nothing to you guys, but in that day, like, he was the teacher. He was the guy to study under. Paul studied under Gamaliel. He had, like, the best education. He was a Pharisee. Paul, like, was, like, a big name in, in the spiritual leader circuit. He, he had the right education. Paul was, again, Paul was the guy. And yet here he is saying, man, God, give me the words. He had the education. He had the experience. And yet he's saying, I am trusting God to give me the words to say. How much more do we need to say, God, give me the words? I, I, I want to love this person. I want to encourage this person. But I don't want to mess it up. I'm so afraid of what's going to happen if I say the wrong thing. Well, that doesn't need to be a fear. If God is working through us, if we're his ambassador, if we're connected to him through prayer, we're listening to what he wants to say. We're trusting him to speak through us, to love, to encourage, and to be that for other people. Pray for clarity. Paul, again, he knew it wasn't his efforts. He was an educated guy. He's a great guy, but it's not about him. Philippians 2, it's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It's not about us. It's not about me saying the right thing or the wrong thing, which I personally tend to do more often than not. It's about us aligning our will our willingness, our intention to God's and saying, God, use me, speak through me, give me the words. So often, it goes back to, to verse 18, which, which talks about praying in the Spirit. So often you see in, in, in the Bible, people, it says, being filled with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. They spoke, they taught, they prayed. We've got to rely on the Spirit. We've got to pray and say, God, use me. 
I'm a tool. I'm, it's not about me. I'm just a tool. That's encouraging, right? Look at the person next to you and like, you're a tool. <laughs> no, okay, maybe not. <laughs> I, I want to be used by God. I want to be the person that he encourages other with, others with. I want to be the person that he uses to, to bring someone's eternal destination from punishment to life and joy and peace. I want to be used by God. So, when I don't know what to say, I need to pray for clarity. Finally, I think the big one, I'm afraid. I'm scared. <laughs> I mean, if we're honest, like, I, I don't want to look like a moron. Like, there's some of these guys out here that are like, I, I, I don't want to be like them. I don't want to tell other people about my faith because well, they may find that offensive. And these days, like, you can't offend anybody. Say, like, we have lots of excuses. But it all comes down to our own security, our own fear. We're afraid. Pray for confidence. Sometimes that that doesn't mean removing fear. Sometimes it means trusting God enough to take a step forward in the middle of our fear. I don't know what to say. People are going to ridicule me. Whatever your fear is, sometimes it's just that confidence to move forward despite all that. I love um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It's one of my favorite passages. It says, oops. <laughs> it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Trusting in God. Not, not, not saying, like, I need to see the big picture. I need to know that I'm not going to get ridiculed. I need to know that something bad is not going to happen to me. Like, that's, that's not, it's, it's trusting God and saying, you're leading, I'm submitting to your leadership, I'm praying and saying, I know that you're with me, I'm connected to you, and so I'm submitting and you're going to... There's another version of the CEV I I read. This verse, it says, With all your heart you must trust the Lord and not your own judgment. Always let him lead you, and he'll clear the road for you to follow. Which this week is kind of a funny verse to think about, the whole clearing the road thing. But but I, I, I like being out in nature, and um, I, hiking and, and being in the woods. I play disc golf, and so I spent a lot of time like, going through brushes and trying to figure out where my disc landed because it's up in the bushes somewhere. But like, I always think about these little trails where I'm like, there's briars cutting into me, and there's, you know, I'm, I'm digging around. But this picture of God, like, I, I'm trusting him. I'm following him, and he's leading the way. He's clearing the path. He's cutting out the things, and he's making a way for me to get where I need to be. It's all about me submitting my will to his will, trusting him, trusting him through everything that that he's got a plan, he's got a purpose for my life. And if I'm submitting to him, if I'm constantly in contact with him, if I'm communicating with him, he's going to lead the way. I can trust that he's going to get me where he wants me to be. So as we close up and finish thinking about um, the empowered empowerment of prayer in our lives. I wanted to take a couple minutes and just pray. Um, Since we're talking about prayer, you know, Jesus said, my house will be known as a house of prayer. Like, let's let's do some praying. Um, Go ahead and bow your heads. And and first thing that I want to say is, check yourself and talk to God because as I talk about this whole ambassador and and submitting to God's will and all this stuff, I'm not naive to, to think that there's not some people in here that might be thinking, yeah, I'm not bought into this. Like, I can't say that I'm an ambassador for God because like, I'm not sure that I really even believe right now that there is a God or that Jesus died for me and all this stuff that you're talking about. So if you're in that place, let me ask you to, to think about that. Are you an ambassador? Maybe you have questions. That's okay. Let me encourage you, if you're in that boat, to find somebody to talk to. Come to me, to Pastor Brian. Any, anybody here, say, hey, I, I have questions. I would love to talk more about that. That's a good place to start. But if you are an ambassador, let me encourage you to take one minute and say, 
God, I want to be used by you. I want to be your tool. God, use me and, and use me well. So take a minute and talk to God about you being an ambassador. Take a minute to thank God now for salvation. He gave us this ministry of reconciliation. He has saved us. Thank him for that. Thank him for restoring your relationship with him. Finally, take just a minute to admit your insecurities and pray that whatever your insecurity is, that God will help you to move through it, past it, around it, to serve him well despite your own insecurities, to trust him, to submit to his will. Admit your insecurities. Lord God, I just want to start by thanking you for salvation. God, we deserve separation from you. We deserve punishment. Your word says that the wages of sin is death. We deserve death. And yet you had a plan from the beginning to restore us to you. God, thank you for salvation. Thank you for reconciliation. God, thank you that we have purpose to share that hope, that good news with those around us. Thank you for calling us your ambassadors. May we represent you well. May we move past our own insecurities. And even in the middle of those insecurities, submit our will to your will. God, help us to trust you more. Amen. As you get ready to go into this week, I was talking about insecurities uh, a, a few years ago, in Kids Men, we did this event called Donut Be Afraid. Um, yes, I think to work with kids, you have to have a certain level of cheesiness. Um, but we talked about fear and um, insecurity and stuff like that. And we put together this as a handout for kids because I had read that there are 365 times in God's Word that you'll read don't be afraid. Fear not. Those types of phrases over and over again. That's once for every day of the year. I feel like every day there's times when I have insecurity. There's times every day when I have fear. If I'll spend time in his word, if I'll spend time praying to God, if I stay connected to God through his word and prayer, things are going to change. I'm going to change. So let me encourage you, as you go, Spend time in God's word and spend time talking to God and listening to God. Love you guys. See you next week. You are dismissed.